We got one of the coolest brothers in Hollywood. This is everybody's uncle. Matter of fact, do you mind if I call you Uncle Garrett? Oh, my God. I get it all the time from Andre and Kay. Yeah, Uncle G. That's what I'm calling, Uncle G. Okay. And, and, and pardon me, Andre, pardon me, Kay. And this is his niece and his nephew yes. in the background. But but for, for the minute, I'm going to be family. Uh -huh. Uncle G. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Andre. Thank you. And like I said, I'm glad to see your parole officer hook you up and you're not you're out walking around. No, I'm out walking around. I'm free. I'm free. They let me out just to do this interview. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. <laughs> I got the ankle bracelet on. As soon as we're done, they're shackling me up and taking me back. Oh, I don't know, you're looking good, man. You're looking good. What's that you got on your chest? Oh, no. power move. If, if, if I can look as good as you, I'm good. No, I'm, I'm trying to be like you when I grew up, man. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, okay, can, can we start off? Let's start off in a positive way. Yes. Huh? Let's start off in a yes, positive way. Yes, yes, yes. Stag, 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 stag after. Over. Thank you. Over. Benito, three years. For three years, at least. You get to go back to work and make them millions again. Make, well, you know, a few pennies, a few nickels, a few dollars, you know, whatever, to help me pay the rent. Uncle G, <laughs> you get to go back to work. I mean, like, let, let's call it what it is, brother. You've been doing this for so damn long. Like, when, 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 when this SAG after strike happened, does a person like you say, thank God, I finally got a chance to rest? Or are you like, what are they doing? All I know is work. Well, you know, I don't know how to say this. I'm kind of lucky that the strike didn't affect me the way it affects everybody else. Um, but that doesn't mean that I didn't have serious concerns. Because only about 20% of us, I don't know if you know this, Sean, only about 20% of actors are working steadily at any given time. About 80% are working sometimes in doing other jobs. And frankly, me and other actors who are not really affected like that were worried about the 80 of the 80%. Okay. So it's not about us being alone out here. We like that. We joined, you know, so we're back there. I was an extra, you know, uh, working here and then and sometimes, you know, so for me, um, the thing I was hoping is that the, not only with the producers, think sensitively, but the members of the union, the leaders of the union would think sensibly, not be hardcore and stretch out the strike. Because even if you're coming from an agency viewpoint or from a producer viewpoint, you're affecting about 80% of actors who are working sometimes, but sometimes they're working those temporary jobs. They're trying to pay the rent, trying to pay for gas, trying to pay for lights, something with kids. So I'm glad that now it's over. And that 80%, at least for three years, doesn't have anything to worry about. Yeah, some of the things that they were fighting over, you know, once upon a time, it was yeah. unheard of. You know, they, they, they're trying to protect their rights against uh, AI, artificial intelligence, so that that, that won't be t kicking up. Could, could you even believe some of these well, issues? I, this is the world that well, we I'm going to tell you, I think it is... I can't even use the word outrageous, unbelievable, that some human being would say, I have a right to use you and your work for nothing or little of nothing. How dare you mm. challenge that? But on the other side, we have to blame the unions because this has been going on since the 1990s. But it was a little bit at first. And it kept increasing and increasing. And now it's so obvious. For instance, what they want to do now, the producers want to take extras for like a half a day, hook them up on count, on video for half a day, then send them home. And no matter how long the shoot went, if it went for weeks, months, whatever, they could reproduce through AI what they got on giving the actors a half a day, half a day's work. So that's really why now the the, uh, the the union has said, oh, we've been letting this happen 
and look what it's grown to. This shit uh, in the 1990s started off say, no, if you use somebody's image, pay them. If you use somebody's writing, pay them, right? Because look, you got somebody coming from, uh, you know, business school who's a producer. He said, well, it's not the actors who are number one, it's his shareholders. That's who, who's number one. Right. And the actors are not even secondary or tertiary. They may be fourth or fifth down the line. Which means you are using these people like they were slaves. Like they don't even matter to it's their product you're making money from. Why not everybody make some, let's make some money, even extras? You know, you brought up a statistic that I, I had no idea. I'm not in your business and you are absolutely one of the blessed ones, one of the fortunate ones. You said only 20% of actors are straight, working, straight at uh, consistently. Yeah. At, yeah, yeah, consistently. You know, you've been doing this thing for over 60 plus years. Since 19, uh, 1959. 1959. I started out not as a... What is huh? it that makes... I started out not as an actor, right? although I intended to be an, an actor, writer, singer. I started singing in a singing group as a singer arranger with a guy named Harry Belafonte. While I was, uh, that was about a six month of work. If you, on the other six months, I would go and do some off Broadway stuff. So I've been here since doing this since 1959. I guess my question to you is is there, I mean, there's an actor that might stumble across this in this interview. What is it that you can give them in terms of a gem, a tip, um, some insight to your success? Like it is no small thing in any industry, whether it is uh, Hollywood, whether it's the music industry, uh, the, the computers and technology. To consistently work for the amount of time that you have, it's incredible. And and, and it is definitely a, a, a blessing from above. What can you share with somebody out there who's aspiring or they're, they're doing a little work and they want to have that same career as you? Well, I, you know, I'm not a high on giving advice. But I would say just keep on believing in yourself because you're going to be hit with so much stuff that's going to challenge your self-esteem, challenge your inside, challenge your spiritual life. The one thing you cannot let them do is cause you to doubt yourself. No matter how bad it becomes, keep on believing that your goal, you will achieve it. Okay. Uh, for me, uh, you say, you know, consistency at work, but what, and during the eighties, I didn't work that much. Oh, well, okay. I did. Because mm -hmm. there was someone that I didn't know about who was working hard to keep me from working by telling agencies and production companies not to hire me. I didn't know about that until somebody, the gossip got around to me that it was happening. So in the 80s, I did a lot of uh, <laughs> horror movies, okay? <laughs> I have at least six horror movies I did. One called The Stuff, which is a cult favorite. And which I, it's a cult classic. Oh, uh, you know about it? Because... At the, at the oh, end, yeah. my head gets blown off. But, uh, yeah. Yep. But I didn't really reemerge into doing the kind of work that you're talking about until the early 90s when I got Martin. You know, no, actually, I went, um, I did some of the Jefferson. I was two years on the Jefferson. Nobody really knows that, but I was a two year regular on the Jefferson. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. But that's when stuff started happening because. Even though it was a bit bad during the eighties, I didn't let it affect my belief that somehow I would work the way I wanted to work. And it began to happen really for real in the early nineties, uh, with Jefferson, with, uh, Martin, with, uh, the Game of Fox. I did a, I did a year or so with, um, Charles Dutton, Joe Rock. Um, you know, so, all I can say, just, uh, just, you know, as, as hard as it may be, and I know it's hard because there were times when I even dealt with doubt because stuff was coming at me where I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. 
But you got, can't let them take that away. That's the one thing they're taking away that you're not going to make it at all. You know, I got a random question for you because even as you're speaking, I, I just thought, of <laughs> do they still make you audition? Like when you walk in the room, are they still like, well, we need you to read for this part? I am very humble about that. You know why? Marlon Brando had to audition for mm. Godfather. Get well, out if Marlon here. Brando had to audition, you know, most of the time I'm not asked to audition, but once or twice I am, you know. Matter of fact, I auditioned for Two Broke Girls. They made you audition for Two Broke Girls? They didn't girls? make me. They said you got to audition. I said, okay, I'll audition. <laughs> I think the producer had me in mind anyway, but he was going through the process, you know, because he was making everybody else so this I think um, that I had, you know, a little advantage when I went in. But yes, I did audition. Yeah. Okay. So do you, at this point in your life, take it personal? No, I do. Like, oh, are you crazy? No, I don't. I'll either say no, I won't, or I'll go and audition. Either one. I look, most of the time. So have you actually. Most of the time, I'm not asked to audition. So the once or twice time when I am, okay. You know, like I said, Marlon Brando had to audition for Godfather, which is a role we remember him for out of all the roles he ever did. And he did an extraordinary job in that movie. Some would think yes. that defines yes. the movie, Marlon Brando playing uh, Don Corleone. But he had to audition for it. And he stuffed his mouth out told with cotton when he went in to do it, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, I had no idea that, I mean, Marlon Brando, you know him from On the Waterfront. Yeah. I, I wanted to see that one in the ward by that Huh? Time. Yeah. I said he had done on the right. waterfront. Um, you know, th this was an established, award-winning actor. By the time he he had won the Oscar, what is Godfather like? Nineteen. Oh God, I remember. I can't believe they made him audition. One of my favorite movies of all time. Remember the first two Godfathers are uh, two of my favorite movies. Now the third one, not, not so enough. much. But the not first so two, bad man. I love them both. Now, nah, the first two, those are two of my favorite movies, and I can't pick which one I like. Either. Either. You know, I don't know if I love the part one or part either. two better. Either. I want to go back to the beginnings, if you don't mind. You, everybody knows you from Hollywood, but you, you're a long way from yes. Hollywood. You, you're from New Orleans. Good time, right? New Orleans, the 19th Ward, New Orleans. I was born in 1937 in Charity Hospital. But at that time, before Katrina, Charity Hospital was working. And, and this is the 30s, the segregation time. So if you were black, you were only in the east wing of the hospital. Because apparently, white people thought they, they could catch blacks. So you, if you were black, you were not in any other wing. So I was born there in 1937. My mom says at 301 on a Monday morning. And I, uh, from the time I was born to the time I was like really 20, 21. Well, from the time I was born to the time I was 13, I spent my winters in a place called Morgan City, Louisiana. And I spent my summers in New Orleans. By the time I was 13, I was back in New Orleans for good. And I went to uh, Booker T and Delhi University and graduated and went to New York when I was like 21, 22. You know, in, in me researching for this interview, I saw another interview of yours and it was, I, I learned something I never, ever known before. And, and if you don't want to talk about it, I'm fine. Did I hear you correct when you were interviewed and, and you said you were the product of rape? Your mother was raped at 16? When years old? I was in my 30s, my mother had never even mentioned that. I was talking to her about the family because, you know, Alex Haley had done Ruth and we were talking about how we loved that and everything. 
And I said, Mom, you know, we ought to do something like that. I ought to write something like that. And I said, tell me about the family, right? First, she told me um, that my grandmother, Gertrude, was born on an Indian reservation in Plaquemine Parish. So I said to her mom, I said, Mom, Mati is an Indian. Now she said, no, Gary, she, she, she's an uh. inward just like us. I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, Mom, she was born the daughter of a redskin on the reservation. That means you are biologically and legally an Indian. You know what she said? Oh, you know, that's right. Uh, My mom, I never even thought of her mother, was born on a reservation, the daughter of a Redskin Indian. She never thought of her that way. And I, too, had never thought of her that way because, you know, the black community has so many biologies. In New Orleans, there are white people, literally, biologically white, who are members of the black community. So you don't think she's just a Negro, right? So that's the one thing she said. Then I, she said, uh, I said something about me getting, coming, how I was going. She said, well, Garrett, uh, let me tell you this. I was walking across Earhart Boulevard, the train tracks, and your father, Willie Morris, jumped out of the bushes, grabbed me, threw me down, and raped me. And she said, up until that time, I, mind you, my, Grandmother was born in a time when church members did not do what they should have done, which is to tell their daughters and their sons the birth by the birth of the bees. So my mama taught until she was 15 years old that you go down to the docks of the Mississippi River and you buy a baby. So after that, she's getting pregnant, she's getting fat, and her cousins are telling her, you're pregnant. And she's saying she didn't know what that meant, right? So within nine months, I come out. And the story is not so good my, about my grandfather, whom I love to this day. But he was a Baptist minister who treated her very badly. He called her a whore. So she told him she was raped. She didn't believe it. Why? Because there had been a young man whose name was Isaac Johnson who used to come and court my mom. So that's who my grandfather saw. So when she got pregnant and said Willie Morris, my biological father, had raped her, he called her a liar and put her out of the house. Matter of fact, for the first six months of my life, I was not in my grandfather's house. I was with my Aunt Tina. So my aunt Tina, you know, said, What's, what, are you, what are you talking about? And she took my mom, took her in. For six months, my mother with me was there. Then my grandmother, my grandfather's wife, had had enough. She goes to the house on Pine Street, gets me and my mom, and brings her back to the house on a, 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 a the name of street I just kept my head. Bring me back. And as she's coming to the house, my grandfather says to her, you can come in, but that whore can't. And my grandmother says to him, if she don't come in, I don't come in. That's when he relented. And the last thing he said after that was, remember your past. Because apparently my grandfather was a hypocrite who in his past had made a lady pregnant. And I met the mm. results, but I have an aunt mm. whose name was Aunt Celestine. My Aunt Celestine was the result of him making a, a girl pregnant. So the fact that he even treated my mom the way he did, or called my grandma, my grandmother Gertrude was saying to him, you're being a hypocrite. Remember your past. You know? So yeah, I'm the result of a rape, but I didn't find that until I was like in my 30s. I think my mom didn't want to talk about it, but finally she did. Have you ever met your biological father? Ooh, once or twice. And maybe by the time he died, it was like 60, once or twice in 60 years. Okay. He was basically absent from my life. Okay. Um, basically, my grandfather, the one I just talked about, 
uh, raised me along with my grandmother until I was 13. My grandmother died when I was 10, and she was the most greatest example of unconditional love that has ever been in my life. My grandfather loved me too, but he was the one who pulled out the belt with the hell out of me <laughs> if I was bad, which I was quite a lot of time. So in talking about my grandfather, believe me, I owe him a lot. But on that particular thing, he was very hypocritical. Uh, but no, my grand, my real father was never really in my life. You know, and, and I had wanted to cuss him out by the time I was an adult. But he went to the Navy and when he came back, he was very mental. So I couldn't do that because by the time I come back, he was 100% on the mental side. Gotcha. You know, we, we are in a political season right now. Um, there were so many gubernatorial races that just took place. And um, the Democrats really did yes, well it did. across the United States. They did well this go round, but they won on on uh, one of the major issues was Roe vs. Wade. It was overturned, um, and many of Excuse their uh, Republican counterparts. Excuse me. Was... Excuse me. Go ahead. I hate to do it. I'm getting off them. Doing one one or two a day. Now, you know damn well, at your age... I die from two packs to like one or two a day. So for all those people looking, shut up. <laughs> so go ahead, you were saying, but uh, the Democrats have... Uh, yeah, they... And, and you're more than welcome to keep... You're more than welcome to keep doing what you're doing. But let's get back to the Democrats. I am aware of the fact in what Ohio helped me, Michigan... And a couple of us in Kentucky, I think. In Kentucky, yeah. yep. Yeah. Traditionally, traditionally red states, they now have Democratic. Because it, the thing about that, Sean, is this. All of these statistics mm -hmm. show, with regard to abortion, people want women to be in control of their bodies. They don't want women to be forced to have an abortion even have forced to keep the baby, even if it's on rape or incest, or for that matter, whatever reason a woman might feel, right? Because she is the one who's going to do it for nine months and probably for the next 21 years of the, of the child, she's going to be the one doing it. So for me, the fact that about 60 to sometimes 80% in some states of people say, yeah, the woman should be in control, you have a very small minority in Congress who are doing it the other way and they don't care about, and they claim to be about life, real life. They've used that very successfully because it sounds like they really can tell. First place, they're not going to tell about the life of the woman. They're telling you a slave for society. We're going to force you to have these babies. They're not concerned, in my opinion, about the life that she creates, because that boy, for instance, can grow up to 18 and be sent to war and get killed. They don't stop that. Why? We've got a whole lot of guns out here killing people, all of that. But for me, the fact that it's being done, a whole lot of things are being done against the will of what, obviously, what the majority want in a democracy, which is supposed to go that way. For me, that has been frightening. And this is, for me, one of the things that happened that caused me to be a little bit Frightened because, man, you have a guy who is an admitted rapist, who's an admitted, uh, for me, he got on TV and said, just grab the pussies, right? He's, I mean, he's, his statements are obviously racist all the time. Yet we have these people who support him unconditionally. I mean, could you have the guy from Russia right now who is now the speaker? From, I think he's from Louisiana, right? He's there because he's for mm -hmm. a, a abortion, right? For he's there for a woman being made to, the guy who didn't get it was against that. So that small minority in the Republican Party is saying, we want all of this bad stuff, this stuff. I mean, the votes for instance, the voting rights are being challenged everywhere. Gerrymandering is going on. And good, thank you that some Supreme Court decisions have been against that. 
despite Clarence Thomas and uh, Amy Barrett and all that, you know. But for me, um, the, 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 the abortion issue is for me like treating a woman like she's just chattel. She's just a slave. You have no right to make a decision about your own body. And why? Because my religion says, no, well, do you know what? If you're a Christian, you should know there's no statement from Jesus about abortion in the Bible. Find it and send it to me, Christians who are listening. There's nowhere where Jesus says anything about it. Now, I believe if you're dealing with Christianity and the philosophy that Jesus, he might have had some negative opinion about it, but there's nowhere in the Bible can you say any word comes from him saying that. So if you claim that you're representing Jesus when you have this attitude, you are not. But what you're also claiming that you're about a democracy. So if you're claiming that no matter what the majority wants, right, you have a right to impose your religious beliefs on the majority. You're not about democracy. And they claim, for instance, that the reason why this country should be more into a Christian thing is because the people who started it were Christian. That's a lie. You know what the name for most of the guys who are the founding fathers, you know what that name should be? Deist. Capital D E I S T. Go to your computer or your phone. That means they do believe in God, but believe in no religion. They don't believe in that at all. They don't think there's any book. Deist, like I think my Thomas Jefferson, uh, um, Franklin, uh, Benjamin Franklin, George White, all those guys believe, yeah, in God, but they do not believe there's any book, including the Bible. That reviews that. Matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson rewrote the New Testament. Did you know that? No. He rewrote it and no. excluded all of the miracles. He excluded one or one. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you can find it if you check out. But he rewrote it and he excluded all the miracles, including walking on water, changing water, water and wine. Now, when it comes to Lazarus, although I'm a Buddhist, I believe way back there because Jesus was also an Essenian. Do you know what that is? It was a real, there was no, a real no. ascetic group that practiced meditation and all that stuff in the desert. Jesus was there for a minute and he might have learned some chiropractic techniques and stuff like that. All right. So I'm willing to say way back there, they might not have understood that the man Lazarus was in a coma, not dead. And Jesus, from what he might have known about how to manipulate the body, might have brought him back. I'm willing to accept that. But if you go to the, your computer right now, and if you can find it, there's a book by Thomas Jefferson himself where he eliminates all the miracles. By the way, there's a question about Thomas Jefferson's biology, by the way. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that, but I'm definitely going to yeah, look up this on, book. On your phone... Put in prints, talk about presidents who were not white, and see what you come up with. Before he died, Prince. Okay, I'm writing yeah, it down as we speak. Went, yeah, put it in. Including Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, yeah I'm writing yeah. it down now. But you know, I, I asked you that question about Roe versus Wade because you have a very, very interesting take on it. You, you're the yes. product of it. Yeah, I am. Literally. And, yeah, it, it, it's it's so interesting because we were talking about the governor in, uh, in Kentucky, and his name escapes me. But one of the ads that he ran was, you know, a young girl who was raped at 12 years old, and she was not allowed to get rid of her baby. Okay. So he actually let the right. victim of the rape um, speak for amazing. herself. Right, he did? I remember that ad. Yes, yes, yes. Amazing, yes. amazing. Yes. Amazing. For me, that there are people who would trample on the rights of a, to make a 12 year old have the baby to make her do that. I mean, that's the whole weight of the the society coming down on this one, one 12-year-old. 
to have everybody saying, you know, and make not even feel that she's done something evil when she's doing something for her own self. Why would you want to have for the rest of your life the evidence of your rape looking at you, talking to you? Why? Why would you give satisfaction right. to a rapist? And some rapists have even gone to court to sue. You know? For me, it's just what do you mean? a couple of times. That's one time where a rapist did, and he won. And you meant, because there's another case where the girl was made to have the baby. I've got, it's, I bet it's on your thing, but yeah, there was one time when the rapist sued and won in court. So sued for the victim to keep yes, the baby? and he won in court. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Can you Look, believe I'm that? sure that my mom was given different kind of a thing about me when I was coming up. And had it happened, I said, we wouldn't be here, Sean. That's all. Okay. People said, well, how would you feel? I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel nothing. I wouldn't be here. Okay. Uh, and I would be one of the quadrillions, maybe more, of human beings who never make it. Because let's say you and I both know when your scrotum is filled with a lot of, uh, Sperm, that at least a couple hundred sperm back there who never get to make a human being. So if you're alive, a human being, you're like Correct. maybe a half percent or one percent of all the human beings who, who could ever exist. I have a joke. I have a joke for that. I hope I can tell it on your, on your. Go ahead. Let's you hear. know, the head coach of the sperms uh, announced one day, look, there's going to be an egg available in about 30 days. So y'all get ready, sperm. So the middle sperm went back and he rested, but one sperm said, uh-uh, I'm going to be ready. So he worked out. He lifted, pumped iron. He did ab stuff. He ran all that. And for 30 days, he just worked out. So when the day came for the egg to appear, he was ready. The other million weren't. So the sperm croaked shot the uh, starting gun, and they started running. But the guy who'd been worked out, he zipped out like, oh, he's done a million miles an hour. So the rest of the brethren said, well, what the fuck? Hey, we may not even try. He's going to get it, right? They turn around to go back, and then they hear somebody say, hold on! It's a blowjob! It's a blowjob! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see the end of that joke coming. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I know I'm being nasty, nasty, nasty. <laughs> no, I love it, man. I love it. That's hilarious. Oh, you know, you know what, what I didn't know? I didn't realize you didn't start off as a comedian. I'm not, you I'm not, I'm as I'm not a comedian. I know people have that impression, but if you talk to my ex-wife, she will tell you what she used to tell me anyway. She would say, Negro, you ain't funny. Well, she wouldn't use the, she used the other N word, right? I am a guy who was in a funny show uh, many years ago called Saturday Night Live, and I have been suffering yes. ever since, God. Because everywhere I go, people want me to be funny. And like I said, my ex wife will tell you I'm not. No, I am a guy who started off as a singer, composer, singer, arranger with Harry Belafonte. I was always intending to be in acting and writing, okay? So once after six months, Harry's job was about six months each year. The other six months, I would do an off Broadway show and a couple times maybe work work. Two plays, both of which were produced in New York. But I, by the time Saturday Night Live discovered me, I'd been in the business 17 years, and I had at least 20, 25 plays on and off Broadway, uh, one of which was Instable to Die Natural Death, Nothing Pupils uh, play. Um, so by the time Saturday Night Live, you know, discovered me and made people think I was a comedian, Matter of fact, I was hired as a writer on SML, not as a comedian, hired as a writer. Uh, because Lord Michael had read one of the plays I wrote 
and saw something was funny. In it. But by the time um, I got to Saturday Night Live, I had already done acting, drama, you know. Uh, I had written two plays. I had um, was had been a fun to have at least four or five things I arranged and composed. If, if Lawson Gould Publishers are still around, my arrangement and composition are with them right now. So by the time Set Down Live, and I had also taught public school on the, on the Lower East Side. I had about a year of teaching, um, you know, um, and it was in the ghetto. Matter of fact, uh, just to digress, when I did uh, Cooley High, which was about a black teacher in the ghetto teaching, you know, children in depressed area, uh, area of the city, I was all I was doing that on the Lower East Side, which would make it mysterious as to why when Michael Schultz tried to cast me in the role of a black teacher teaching in a depressed area, the producer said, "No, we don't want it." Yeah, did they know your background? Whatever, I don't know if they did. I do know that they told Michael Schultz they wanted a. Um, to the Poitier type, because they had seen To Serve to serve with Love. You ever seen that movie, To Serve with Love? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they wanted, right? And Michael had to take me into the lady's office and convince her to let me play the role, which, as I look back, is one of the best things I ever did. But I want to touch on something that you just said. I know you were teaching on the Lower East Side when you got that role that we all, I mean, come on, Cooley High, it, it, it is an iconic film in our community. We grew up to that movie. We love that movie. Everybody know Garrett Morris in that movie. But it mirrored your life. Didn't you also teach in the prison system? Um, if I got yes, it right, you preached upstate New York in yes, while I, was, I, and, um, yes, while I was teaching, but let me explain this something. My degree was in music, period, not in music education. New York University in 1968 had this special program where if you could go to uh, them school for like six months, they would give you a teacher's license, which is what I did. So I got a teacher's license, which then qualified me to teach on the Lower East Side. And while I was there, there was this program which also sent teachers to prison to teach. So I was sent to um, a play, um, upstate New York has a prison called um, Comstock. It's yeah. Kaksaki. Comstock. Com Kaksaki. No, Comstock. 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 But there's Comstock, also yeah. one called Kaksaki, which is for um, teenagers, yep. right? Comstock is for murderers, yep. right? And then, um, Great Meadows Correctional Facility is the proper name, but it's called Comstock as that's the uh, nickname, right? So I was teaching music and drama to those murderers. <laughs> and we did a play while I was there. I asked, I said, do any of you guys have any poems you've written? And they, they had poems they had written. So I compiled, because I have, had been in, um, and Melvin, Pe Melvin Brown Peoples play, which was a compilation of poems. So I said, hey, why don't I do that in prison? So we, in fact, did a whole two hour show with those prisoners' poems, which were revered by the Albany Gazette, right? And mind you, teaching in prison is not something, if you were like me, you can really do for a long time, because you're teaching in prison, you are in prison. So when the guard is taking you yes. to the to the auditorium, you walk a few paces. He opens another uh, metal door, and then he, and that that sound they have in Law and Order. That, mm -hmm. that's you hear that sound all the way to the auditorium, and there's always with a guard in the auditorium as I'm doing. Uh, do I try to do the play, and I remember something funny because. The guys in front, I was giving them to do the play, but all the time, way in the back, there was another group 
sitting way on the left in the back. So I couldn't understand why they weren't joining, right? So one time I made a mistake of going to the back. And as I approach him, I realize what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with the wives, the wives of the guys in front. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got closer and I said, Oh, I see it. I turned around and went the back, you know. But yeah, yeah, that was it. And the thing is, um, while I was there, I acquired two guys who were my enforcers. They told me, they said, Mr. Morris, you need enforcers. Because even though the guard was there, uh, they were aware of the fact that that didn't matter unless I had someone that was respected by the other guys who was saying, hey, don't fuck with it. So the other guy, uh, his name was Bama. He was built like Mike Tyson and he had no teeth, right? And this guy, you could, he, uh, he better, you could see he could take out the house. Him and another tall guy were my enforcer for the year that I was there. And the year stretched out to be a year and a half because you do for two months and you rest for like a month, man. Come back for another two months, rest for them, you know. That's how I did it. Okay. Did, did, did you ever bump into any yes. of these guys once you yeah, grew yeah. up? And Matter of fact, really? um, not before Saturday, before Saturday Night Live. Uh, I was in Brooklyn one time waiting for a cab or something like that. And the guy, Mr. Marks, Mr. Marks, he said, he said yeah. I was in the joint. You taught me I was in the joint, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he also told me, unfortunately, that Bama had been found dead in the lobby of uh, an apartment building. Yeah. So somebody got oh, to Oh, man. Yeah. But he was a man. Oh, yeah, man. man. He man. He Sorry man. Man. Yeah. You know, you talked about Harry Belafonte, Mr. B. What what type of person was he in real life? Because you you have this extraordinary career, and you just are rambling off names that, from us on the outside, these names have shaped culture. They 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 have defined not just parts of our life, but parts of the fabric of the life that we get to enjoy. And Mister B. Himself, I mean, this guy was there during the um, civil rights movement. He, and I love people like him who were so yeah. bold. Uh, they, they, they made yeah. it. They made it. They, they, they were the good. Him people. and Dick Gregory, you know, he, he had the curly yeah. hair. Him, Dick Gregory, and Simone. And, and, um, um, I was the youngest member of the. Better Fund the Singers. Let me explain. The Better Fund the Singers were 12 guys, right? Whom Harry managed. Mm -hmm. They didn't sing with him all the time. He managed them and sent them around the country singing folk music. There were six white guys, six black guys. He did have four guys who always sang with him, right? But on special occasions, like if he sang at the palace in New York City, or at the Hollywood Bowl uh, here in L.A., then everybody would be behind him, okay? So I was with this particular group that he sent around. First thing. Secondly, um, this was the third group he had formed. So I was the youngest member of the third group, and I became a member in 1959. And I was there until 1968. Um, and I was a singer-arranger with him, although I must confess, the competition is very fierce between the arrangers. So they only I only managed to get one of my arrangements done. But Harry himself was one of the most important figures in the civil rights movement. He was always there to speak yes, and support um, Dr. King and Ralph Abernathy, but he also gave his money as well. So financially and in terms of his figure himself, he was always there. And he can truthfully said that the movement 
had one of its main supporters. In our opinion, my opinion, without him, you can't say that it would have been successful without him or people like him. Uh, but my knowing him, I was the youngest member. Okay, so I don't really know him. I was in his presence a lot all the time when he, you know, but I, I knew him more, a lot from just that, but I knew him as much from what I was looking at on TV too. So I wasn't like a personal, like that kind of a friend of his, but I was worked for him and was definitely in the presence of uh, uh, Mr. B a lot where he would, you know, check us out and talk to us. You know, you, you're born, what'd you say, 1937? Yeah. February the first. You you have outlived so many of your counterparts, so many of your peers. Uh, obviously, Mr. B passed away earlier yeah, this year, yeah. I believe. You're seeing all of your brothers and sisters that you came up with, some of which were older than you. We also know, I think Richard a week or two ago, Chef yeah. himself, Richard Roundtree, passed away. Uh, you know, Chef, I'm man. not sure. <laughs> there you go. These are these are guys. They were right there with you. When when you hear that these guys are leaving here, I mean, and, and it's not just the guys. I mean, obviously, in the last year, Tina Turner, she she's passed on. One of my um, favorites. One of my favorites. Of them. Not yet. Yeah. Well, hey, man, uh, there was an old joke which nobody laughs at now. The joke went, life is hard, then you die. Okay? Uh, we don't get out of there. Yeah, we don't get out of there alive. Uh, so uh, the best thing you can do is live this life as well as you can, as happily as you can. Try to make as few mistakes as you can. I've made a lot. Um, and, you know, just have us, in my opinion, the only attitude you can have about death is acceptance. Uh, I hate people talking about fear in death. What the fuck does fear in death do? So it doesn't stop me from dying. If it stopped me from dying, I'd be fearing 100% every day. But this is a process. And if you deal with the scientific thing about molecules and atoms, we never, the molecules and atoms never are destroyed. Uh, our ice is, ice is made of molecules and atoms. But when it melts into water, the ice isn't gone. The molecules and atoms have shifted, changed their dimension. When you put that same water on a pot, on a hot stove, it changes the steam. The water isn't gone, it simply changed. We as well will simply change on a physical level. Now, I don't know. I'm believing and hoping there's something else going on that a little fraction of me that will, you know, that's been inhabiting this body. But in terms of molecules and atoms, basically to say we end is not a correct statement. We don't end. We simply change dimension. We transform to something else. So with that as my belief, I am ready, you know, not now, not now, okay? <laughs> I'm ready to transform. Because I know one day that transformation will, will happen. So I think the best attitude you can have with death is the acceptance that it will have and try to be as happy, you know, and, and as you can until that happens and not be fearing it all the time because you think you're going to hell and all that. All, and all, and all, and all. I mean, for me, I know there are a lot of dedicated Christians who believe that. For me, that's putting a lot of worry on you, okay? As a Buddhist, I'm an agnostic. You know what that means. It means not that I, not that yes, I don't believe yes. that God exists, just that I had made up my mind what it is or who it is or why it is, because uh, there are books written by human beings that say we're made in God's image. Well, that's ego trip on a part of a human being. There's a lot of things out here that supposedly God created which don't look like human beings. Why can they be a tree like in Star Wars? Why, do, why can he be some other form? You know, he's God, right? He doesn't have to be like that, right? Yep. He could be a thing. He could be a whatever, you know? Uh, so for me, if in fact you even deal with the concept of God, 
There's no way that I believe that God made himself in the image that I'm in. Why does he have to have done that if, in fact, God exists? For me, the agnostic thing for me makes more sense. I don't know what it is. I haven't made my mind yet. Okay? It's not, I think it's arrogant to be uh, someone who's declared, you know absolutely what God is to how he puts on his tie, what shoes he wears, you know, the booger in his nose, okay? Or, for that matter, to be an atheist and saying, you know, absolutely, that doesn't exist. How do you know atheist? For me, for me, the most humble thing way I can do with this is to understand that I am here and I don't really know about whether that's true or not. We as human beings are like grains of sand. We are, in my opinion, in a situation where we ought to realize that there's a kind of insignificance to us. It shouldn't be filled with ego and hubris because we can, you know, outthink some other animal. But there's a lot of things that other animals have that we don't have. An eagle can see a, a fly from a mile up, okay? A dog and a cat, you sitting there reading the newspapers, they'll go to the door because somebody's in front of that door that you don't even know is there. For me, there's a whole way in which human beings deal with themselves that is more um, arrogant than it should be. Because if you deal with, if Neil deGrasse Tyson, whom I love, is correct, then we have billions of galaxies. And dealing with a whole molecule atom thing, that means we have countless molecules and atoms of which we are part of that trip. Which means that in terms of the billions of galaxies, we're, we're not even like grains of sand, man. Yeah, right. you know, in that process, right. we are not even like grains of sand. We should be very humble about being, like I said, because out of the quadrillions and more of human beings that exist, we are lucky enough to come out this way. Because in every scrotum, there's about two or three thousand other sperm that didn't make it, okay? So by the time you cut out the trillions of human beings who have been born and have children, you have just uncountable numbers of human beings who could have existed. You know, so you should be feel grateful, lucky, and in my opinion, humble about even being here as you are. I don't know what the original question was, but I think I went off on it. No, you you answered, you answered oh, yeah. the question perfectly. You answered the question absolutely perfectly. You know, you you spoke, you used the word luck. 1975, I believe, if I got it right. You you were cast in at that time. Yeah, Saturday right. Night yes. Live. What, what was the yeah. You're part of you're part of this iconic show that's been on the air now for over 40 years. Uh going yeah, right. on 50 years. Was it just sheer luck that that you were cast? Because you're not even self admittedly. I, I don't see myself as a comedian, and at that time I was a writer, I was a composer, I was a singer, and I was a dramatic actor. I was, actor. I, I, here I was hired as a. I was, sorry, I cut you off. I cut you off. Yes. No, go go I, ahead. I was, I was a, writer. As a writer, and my duty at first was to come up with something funny, which I took a, you know, boy, it took a long time. Because I didn't realize as a playwright, because you can write a play that lasts two hours, doesn't mean you really know how to write a skit that's only a minute long, or 45 minutes long, the third second one. And I was having trouble with that. My other duty was to bring in black actors. Because Lauren Michaels, God bless him, Lauren Michaels wanted to have a non-white, a black member of the not ready for crown time players. So I'm bringing in Bill Duke. I brought in Obama Tunde. I brought in Trey Zion Beverly 
You may not know who she is, but she was a brilliant actor who won a Tony for her role in uh, for Colored Girls. Prisana Beverly for Colored Girls. She won a Tony. So I'm bringing people like that in. But then one day I came in and somebody met me at the elevator and said, Garrett, Lord Michaels wants to see you in the green room. I go to the green room and Lauren is looking at Cooley High because John Belushi, Gilda Radner, Lauren Newman, Dan Curtin, they had told him, well, look, you got Garrett bringing in actors. He's an actor too. And, and they said, look at Cooley High. And sure enough, he did. And after he got to looking at it, he said, Garrett, I want you to audition for the Not Ready for Time Drum Crew. And I auditioned with Gilda Radner. And um, after that, I retired. So I, you know, I came in as a writer, not an actor, and was hired, you know, after my audition. I think that's my uh, phone. I, you know, I have, uh, you hear that sound? Yeah, it's on my phone and I can't find it, but it's telling me my sugar, sugar is too hot. Okay, uh, Dre, you see my phone? Uh, yeah, I got it. Now, give it to me, please. Um, anyway, that's how we came remember not that every time. You know, again, I, I started off the question by saying luck, because it's it, it damn sure feels like you can have the talent, um, you can have the access, but there's a bit of luck that we all need. You know, luck, blessings, however, a, a, a gift from God, whatever it might be, it's that thing you can't account for, that X factor. Because for you to be sitting in that building and they looking at you to bring in the black talent and he goes and watches a dramatic piece on you. It's not like you was telling jokes in Cooley High. For him to bring you in and say, look, I want you to audition. This is a sketch comedy show. It ain't a dramatic right. piece. And for you to get it, there, there, there's a whole lot of luck involved. That is, let me tell you why. Because uh, one of the things that impressed me about the other members of the Not Ready for Time Time Players, John Belushi and Gilda Radner, who were well, graduate of Second City, where they teach you technique they give you the ability to do almost immediately comedy about anything in probably So I consider their range in probably on a comedic level to be like from one to a hundred. You know what I mean? I also trained in a improvisational workshop. Well, where Second City is in the white, was a white workshop. I trained in a black workshop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, conducted by Michael Schultz, Gilbert, um, um, Gilbert Moses, Dick Gregory. And in the black workshop, you were dealing with things like teenage pregnancy, the white man and all the stuff they'd done against black people, police brutality, right? So instead of going to range from uh, one to a hundred, my range was from hate whitey to kill whitey. That was about as much the way I had. So when I was trying to improvise with them, I was always coming up short and I realized it. But another thing is I was so impressed with how they did it. I was quite often we were doing improvisational stuff. I'd be watching them. Say, wow, look what she just did. Wow, look what she just did. And suddenly I realized, oh, you got to be in it, you know? So for me, the fact that I got that job after improvising with Gilda was, yeah, yeah, a whole lot of luck. Because my improvisational my improvisation you know, skills were not up to theirs at all. Yeah, that, that was a talented yeah. cast. You mentioned Jane Curtin. Uh, John Belushi, Gilda Rae. Lorraine Rashford. Newman. Uh, who else was it? Dan Lorraine Ackroyd. Newman, Chevy Chase. I mean, that is an iconic yeah. cast right there. 
how how difficult did you take the news? I mean, you 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 auditioned with Gilda. Oh boy! With, when she passed away, how hard did that hit Man, you? That was a hard hit, Don Sean. That was a hard hit. You made me as you're talking about it, man. Excuse me. She was such a beautiful lady, man. Okay? Such a talented, beautiful lady. And I had a whole lot of problems. Okay? While I was there. Because I wasn't always on the positive side. I was very negative with a whole lot of people. Gilda was one of the few people that I always got along. She and Jane Curtin uh, were always cool with me, okay? But Gilda, man, when she, I knew before she died that she was suffering, right? And boy, 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 when she passed, um, uh, I don't want to do this on your show, okay? Uh. Uh, it was hard to take. And even now, as you can see, when I think about it, it's it just, uh, she's such a brilliant, beautiful lady. Uh, yeah. yeah, she clearly must have been, um, now we're talking easily 30 years, 30 plus years of her passing. And for it to invoke that type of emotion yeah. from you, you know, there are few people that come into our life. We know death yes. is a part of life. We, we we understand that one day we're not going to be here. But for you to be sitting here before me and to get this type of emotion, just thinking about this beautiful human being that yeah. passed through your life, that says yeah. so much about her and her impact in this world. Yeah. Wow. She was, she was something else. Okay. She was somewhere else. Yeah. Always easy to work with. And always easy, you know. I had never heard her say a bad thing about anybody. I'm sure she has, but I never heard. And very talent, very talent, tolerant. Because like I'm saying, it wasn't, I wasn't always on the positive end. I was a lot of negative that was coming out of me. And she was very, very uh, supportive and helpful. You know, speaking of being not so positive, uh, last time I sat down with you, you told me about a gentleman, uh, African American, came on, uh, and I'm not sure if he came on to the show, but he was very outspoken about you being yes. on the show and went so far as to call you right. and Uncle right. Tom. You wouldn't mention his name, and I'm not asking uh -huh. you to mention it now, but if I, because I needed to do right. some research. If I mention his name, can I get a wink? Just to, uh, uh, I, I came up with Franklin AJ, a, a J, something like that. A, a, am I on the right track now? <sighs> All I got to say is you're pretty good uh, at your job. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, because I'm like, who could this have been? And God knows I went and I dug and I did some research. Like, who is this man? But I know your time on Saturday Night Live, it wasn't always no. positive. And you didn't always feel as uh, welcomed within the staff no. as you should have. You want to go into well, that? Well, like I said, I'm not, as a Buddhist, I take responsibility for my part of that. Okay? So a whole lot of negative stuff would come out of me. I was a coke fiend at the time. A whole lot of stuff I was doing that was clearly creating enemies, okay? But I didn't realize the extent of that. Because people, you know, a lot of times you're uh, hooked on a drug or addicted to it, uh, people should be thinking about helping you to rehab as opposed to coming down here judgmentally, which I didn't realize that. Um, so I was creating a whole lot. Of, but on the other hand, there was already a whole lot of racism among the writers. That was a part of what was going on. Um, I'll talk about Michael O'Donoghue, for instance. You know, remember Michael O'Donoghue? You know, he, he, oh, he, absolutely. He, when I absolutely. came to the show, I knew that he was hooked to National Lampoon. So I attached that mystique to him. 
that he was radical, progressive, not not racist, all of that, right? Because I found out that was the exact opposite of what he was. Uh, he, oh my God! Oh, yeah. Damn. Uh, I always tell the story. That the first time we did a show, there was no role for me in anything, except there was this particular skit that had a doctor in it, and Michael had written it. So I said, "Well, Michael, why don't you let me play the doctor?" He says to me, well, Garrett, people might be thrown by a black doctor. No, now, mind you, I'm from New Orleans, where from the time I could breathe, I was aware of not only the fact that I was surrounded by black doctors, some female, but there are a whole lot of black PhDs in that college. Too. And in places like DC, um, Fisk University, Spelman, all those people we had college black town, you're surrounded with doctors, medical and PhD types. And the fact that this man, who was attached to one of the most liberal so-called publications of that time, had this racism in it through me, and it, it, it helped me a lot because it helped me keep him in focus. Because later on, we did do some things together. But I was always the fact well, the fact his racism was the worst kind of it had a lot of hubris in it, you know. Uh, yeah, it was like mm -hmm. the kind that was intellectually up there, and I, you know, and I know it. And, uh, uh, so, but he wasn't the only one, you know. But for the most part, he was one of those who um, his racism uh, for me uh, shocked me, and it was a part of how I had to deal with. A couple other people, you know, but there are some people like Chevy Chase and like Alan Swadell who were on the other side, you know, because I didn't get a lot of people to write for me, but Chevy did, Alan Swadell did, uh, you know, to write for me, and I wrote for myself too, you know. But yeah, it was it was hard dealing with uh, that kind of hubris or what, because it was, it was that, that kind of intellectual kind that seemed to think it really knows that its racism is correct. Yeah, it, it's a very different world um, that we're talking about in the, in the mid '70s. In, in as much as things have changed, so much of it is. Well, and that's something you you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because I'm sure a lot of actors are experiencing the same thing that you experienced forty yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Fifty years. Ago. And also, what. In the last 10, 20, 30 years, I realized that a lot of guys, white guys, that I definitely supported their programs are on the, not on the conservative side, but ultra conservative. For instance, Tom Selleck. I looked at, I look at practically every episode of Magnum KPI, right? And I realized that, uh -huh. you know, really Tom, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood, right? Right. Oh I my said, goodness. really, Clint? You know, really? You asked me uh, vote for this guy and you like this guy? Uh, to me, it's unbelievable. And I'm outspoken right. about it. Uh, you you know who's another one? Anthony, uh, what is her name? Angie Jolie? Angie Angie Jolie? Jolie? I didn't Jolie. know that. Really? No, no, not her. Her father. Oh. Uh, John Voight. John Voight. Who? Her father? Very, very much over the other um, side. Yes, John Boyd. Yes. I didn't know that. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You, you, I mean, before he passed away, I mean, and this is going back ancient history, but you, had, I, I, I remember seeing a documentary with Charlton Heston, and this guy was so... <laughs> Conservative. I, I couldn't even finish the Charles documentary. Oh my oh, yeah. God. Yes. Moses. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Yes. You and I both know that Moses was brown skinned. So that, that, that had this white, yes. red eyed motherfucker playing Moses, just so the extent to which the Jewish relation, Jewish people, have become white. Because you and I both know Judaism is an African religion. The first millennium of yeah. Judaism is in Africa, y'all. Sure, now that 200 years or so, in this country, white people from Yugoslavia, 
and Czechoslovakia have represented it. But the first millennium of it before Africans migrated to Europe and to Asia and to the other countries, it was black people, brown people, tan people, Catholic people, and yes, some white people who were Jews. But the whole Jewish population was not white in Africa. And what pissed me off, after the Jews got their state in 1948, about 20 years later, when the Ethiopians were facing problems with what its refugees came to Israel, the Likud wanted them to be re bar mitzvot and re bat mitzvot as if Ethiopian hadn't been Jews for like millenniums. And the Jews in Africa, right, did not know you that. didn't know that? Yeah. No, no. Matter of fact, the Ethiopians claim to have the actual ark uh, with the Torah in it. They claim to have that. I know it's true. But Judaism is an African religion, like Christianity is also an African religion. Jesus was a woolly haired, brown skinned man born in Bethlehem, y'all. So you're talking about two African religions which have been wrested from Africa by white people and have made people to understand and believe that Jesus was, was white, which he wasn't according to Revelation, the first chapter, 14 to 15 verse. Jesus was woolly haired and bronze skin. Have you seen one in any other church you go to? You know, I just had this conversation with a, with a good friend of mine, a good friend of mine, and we were having it, it almost to the T, the exact same conversation. And I'm like, you believe in the Bible? Right. It's in the Bible. The Bible said he had skin of bronze and he had curse. And they call themselves literal interpretation, interpretation of the Bible, which really pissed me off because if you don't have that, that's something you actually believe you're not a literal interpreter of the Bible. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, yeah. Let, 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 let's something else. <laughs> let's let's bring this thing back. <laughs> you know, speaking of white, uh -huh. speaking of white, yes. speaking of white, you you mentioned you was doing a lot of coke. This is the yes. mid seventies. How much coke was going around during them days, and how prevalent was it amongst your community? Oh, it was everywhere, man. It was everywhere, and um, I thank God for um, oh, the congresswoman helped me. I'll shout you black. She's old now. Um, ah, she's the one who got vaccine. Who, Waters, vaccine? who in like 1980 got in Congress and let people know that the CIA was the one who supplied the money to the to buy okay. the code. And the code was being sent by the, back to this country. And the thing that really messed it up was smoking code. The sniffing was cool, not cool, but it was not as dangerous as smoking. Right. And there's a whole lot of that around because people have just under, met that, dealt with that. Right. So there's a whole lot of it around. Yes. And um, I, you know, admit that I got really deep into it. And at a certain point, I began to realize I made a serious mistake and then <laughs> didn't realize how long it would take me to rescue myself from it. But in the early 1900s, early 2000s, I finally did it. And so I haven't seen cocaine since 2003, four, or five, something like that. So it's been quite a long time since I've Damn. You, you know, the last time I sat with you, you was telling me about John Belushi. <laughs> and you said he was yes, a wild yes. boy. He, he was smoking oh, that God. cocaine left and right. Is there anybody else that would surprise us that was doing as much cocaine? I'm not going to drop a dime on anybody else but John, okay? Because people know. P.O.D. Uh, and I um, remember John would knock on my door, Garrett, you know, he might not talk to me at all for another week, but he'd come and I left my, uh, my, uh, 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 my aluminum foil and no matter how much coke was in it when he started, there'd be just a little bit on the corner. He'd go, mm -hmm. And he's on the roof, you know. Um, and I didn't know about speedballing, which is about he got into. That's how he died. Uh, cause I've never put a needle in my, needle in my arm. 
I never would. Because uh, way back then when I heard about Charlie Parker, that sort of caused me to do the whole thing about not shooting up with heroin or anything. Okay. But, um, you know, cocaine had its own problems. I was getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning. And finally, I didn't have the cocaine. I'd get up in my bed, get in my car, and drive around to find my connection. You know, so I never thought I'd really be free of it. But a whole lot of stuff, including positive thinking and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, helped me to to get out of it. Because at that time, I had not become a Buddhist yet. I became a Buddhist in 2009. But I had been using Buddhist principles, not knowing it, because positive thinking it's a part of Nishiran Buddhist thing. The ones who chant, mm-hmm. the ones who chant, the ones who chant, those are the ones who use also uh, positive thinking as a part of it. Okay. Teach them on you, doing your goals and your chanting. Chanting is a way of praying. Okay. And you're not asking, you're saying, I will be this, I will be happy, I will do this, I will achieve this. It's not you're saying, Please let me help me know. You know, you everyone you say you will do it, which is a whole different feeling that comes from that. You know? yeah. yeah, well, you know, um, cocaine. Let's call it what it is. Cocaine's in 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 the seventies and eighties. It was prevalent. Everybody was doing. I'm glad to hear you say everybody. It like it was something. But you know that some your people who say everybody, you know, you know that, right? Oh yeah. Well, I'm yes, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Go ahead. Everybody, <laughs> not everybody. Everybody was doing it. <laughs> everybody was doing it. But one person who come to mind, another one that we, you know, he was open about it. He, I'd love to know. You being a fellow comedian, what was your thoughts on Richard Pryor during this Richard day? Pryor to this day is, for me, the number one monologuist I've ever heard. One of the most brilliant, to me, the most brilliant really? comedian I've ever heard is Richard Pryor. Now, next to that is Dave and the rest, all of that. Uh, by the way, Lunel, I'll tell you about Lunel, you know. Um, but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Richard was deep into it as I was. And I'm going to blame the cocaine for what he did when he first came to Saturday Night Live. He came and uh, he brought his own people with him. And he made it clear he didn't want to use me or anything. He wanted to bring his own people, which he did. So if you notice that show that he's on, I don't do anything with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that hurt me because then and now, no matter what happened then, to this day, he is my number one greatest monologue I've ever heard. Because anytime he came to New York, I was there. He be at the Forum or Scotting or wherever he came, I was there. Later on, he did a movie called Critical Condition. And I got a, yeah, yep, I got I a call the from the director, Michael Aptek, saying that Richard wanted me to be in the film. So he never said to me, hey, man, you know, so I treat you. He never said that. He just had me in the film, which, you know, we became friends then. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of times I went to his house over on, oh, I've got the name of the street, but it's over. Uh, it's, it's in Bel Air. It's in Bel Air. You know, his house was in Bel Air. But uh, that's when we became friends. And so I assume that was okay, his way. So- <laughs> saying hey did, did you ever get a chance to not ask this like, and I almost feel bad asking it did, did you and Richard ever get high together no 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 but by that really? time I was working hard to uh, not yeah I still hadn't succeeded but I was really working hard to get off so no you know it's interesting that you classify him as the greatest monologuist that you have ever seen. Uh, you know, for, for me, I look at once upon a time, I looked at Eddie Murphy as it, it, this was the all time great. He was on the top of Mount Rushmore. 
but I got to give it to yeah. Dave Chappelle now. You know, for a minute, Chris Rock came yeah, in oh, and did his thing. So it's so interesting that you have lived to see all of these great comedians. I mean, we, we talk about Richard, but right there with him was Red Fox. Um, Let me say He that. was killing it. I was leaning oh, go ahead. on Red Fox. Okay. So when I talk about uh, Richard, I have to say Red Fox, my maybe I grew up on them. And they're in a special category, particularly Red Fox, um, who had, I don't know if I can do it like him. As a kid, I was on the floor with this um, thing that he and Slappy White came up with. It was a detergent. The detergent was called FUGG, F-U-G-G. They told all the ladies, you know, the housewives, if you got a dirty floor, we have a detergent that you will use called Fugged It. So if you got dirt on the floor, just Fugged It. But we also have a complimentary detergent called SUG, S-U-G-G. -G. So if you run on a fug, you sug. So if you can't fug it, sug it. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, as a kid, I understood what that meant. I was on the floor. My red tie. So if you can't fug it, sug it. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the Richard, one of the Richard uh, Pryor joke that I still remember to this day, he was talking about, he said, this woman was so fine. And he said, I'm sorry, ladies, but you're going to hear the next. He said, this woman was so fine, I wanted to suck, suck her daddy's dick. <laughs> 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 but anyway, I agree with you about Eddie, Dave Chappelle, who, in my opinion, is doing it like a motherfucker. Um, Chris Rock, definitely. Those guys, in my opinion, correctly deserve to turn comedian. I think, the reason why I always reject it is because I see it as a very special gift. Now, I had a club, a comedy club for 11 years, why I learned from those comedians who came to my club more that has added to my ability to deliver as a comedian. But at no time, even now, that I consider myself in their class. I'm not. I'm an actor who was in a very funny show, and I have learned to be funny from that, right? Those guys were born with a native gift to make people laugh. So that's why that's why I say when I say about me and I mean I'm not like them. You know that that's so humble of yourself, and it's so self aware at the same time, because you have this amazing career. Um, you're you're on a career defining show, and you don't look at yourself in the same league just in terms of raw comedic skills that they. Yes, natural comedic yes. skills as, as, as some of these greats. So humble yourself to say that, and, and I understand exactly where you're coming from. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, you, you talked earlier, I want to talk about another guy, and I don't know if you consider him to be a comedian or just somebody who was on a, a very funny show. But when you were coming out of Let's call it your down period. Let's call it your scary movie period. You you got cast for two years on the Justice. Yes, yes. Um, that was great. That was great, man. That was great. I worked with Sherman, uh, Isabel, Roger Roker, Ma, um, um, uh, Ma, uh, I don't ever share myself. You know what I mean? Ma, uh, uh Flo. Like, Flo, Flo. Who are we talking about, though? The, 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 uh, Roxy's Flo, husband on the show? Uh, oh, Marla Gibbs. Uh, Marla Gibbs. Oh, man, that was a great time. I really loved it. And they, um, 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 Norman Lear 
rewrote to put me in it. He had to rewrite. He made me a a school person, a guy going to school who had sort of tricked Sherman, uh, Sherman and Isabel. I mean, uh, uh, George Jefferson and Isabel to send me money to go to school, right? And the thing was, um, when I I came to visit them, right, and I let them know that some of it was a scam. And George got mad as hell, right? Right? Then I opened up this attache case. Because <laughs> I told him, I'm your son, I'm your son. He said, you're not my son. No, you're a scam artist, you're a scam artist. Then I opened up this attache case with nothing but money in it. And George said, sons! <laughs> and it was great because uh, George, I never not know, every time, there was once a day when George himself would pay for everybody to eat. He would have this Chinese restaurant he would order food from. I'm sure it cost him a lot of money, but every Wednesday, Thursday, whatever, I think it was the day of the shooting, he would order and you just eat, you know. He was great, man. He treated me great. Isabel treated me great. Roxy, uh, great, you know. Um, you know, Marla Gibbs, and they were all beautiful people. I loved that show. It was only a two-year thing, but, you know, I loved it. You know, that, that, that is one of those iconic shows, uh, not just in our community, but that, that show did really well in the ratings. You know, it's unfortunate because, again, um, it was a yeah. different time. Sherman Hemsley is, well, he's rumored. I don't know if he ever came out. But I never saw that he was married or not. But but he he was a yes. homosexual male yeah. in Hollywood. You know, did, did you know, yes, did. or did any of you guys know that he was in the closet yes, at I that did. time? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I knew a long time. Oh, so so it was an open. I knew. Scene. I knew. No, I knew long before I got on the show. I knew. You know, and um, it's it's a shame that people have to live their lives like that. Absolutely. But, you know, particularly in a world where you claim, you claim democracy is important, love and, and all of that. And, you know, there's so many people who, even right now, are trying to treat people like they're not human beings, you know. That I think the, the president Correct. leader of the Republican Party said that homosexuality will tear down, tear down the very community itself. And by the way, there's a joke that you can tell about Jesus, okay? Let me hear. From 12 to the age of 30, nobody knows what he was doing. But at 30 to 33 is what you see in the Bible. And for three years, he hung out with what? Unemployed guys. Need I say more? Okay? <laughs> you can. Who got mad when he would go, because when he would go, he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane, but then he would go to another corner, of, and, and you know who he took with him? Mary Magdalene. And matter of fact, James, who was his brother, no one the seventh, got complained about that. Now, when he comes to Mary Magdalene, the church had lied about her, because they call her a prostitute. So there's a whole lot in the churches that go, no. That was a result of certain factions way back when the church was only Catholic who didn't like the fact that, mind you, way back there in the first century that they're in Europe, um, Christ, Christ and Christians are still radical Jews. Matter of fact, you can consider the whole religion of Christianity is the success of a radical Jewish sect. Because Jesus in Africa was not a Christian. He was being followed by them. He was a Jew. He was circumcised. No Christians are circumcised. So what you had was a radical Jew in Africa being told by the Orthodox Jews, mind you, Mary Magdalene, when she met David, uh, Joseph, she was already pregnant. So the Orthodox Jews were calling Jesus a bastard. Who hung out with prostitutes, right? That's what they were saying. So when they got to Europe, right, 
what happened was, okay, well, the Catholic said, well, let's see how we're going to get rid of this. We're going to say, not that Jesus was a bastard, but that God impregnated Mary. Who? Probably saw. The other thing was about Mary Magdalene. If you saw, and I bet it's still on the public uh, station, about 30 years ago, there was a two hour show by a historical theologian, theologians who went back and checked out Mary Magdalene. She was, shown, according to them, a very rich woman who hung out with other rich ladies. And yeah, she liked sex. She was profligate. She was fucking everybody. But she had a lot of money. She was not a prostitute. So when you get to Europe, right, a very, now a very paternalistic Christianity, which that wants men to be the number one around you, even to this day, you're probably a Christian, um, 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 female Christian minister, right? So what they did was the people who were paternalistic side, because you and I have known for a couple of centuries there was a fight between strictic sects about what it was going to be, what the world was going to be, what the Bible was going to look, all of that. King James comes along and makes the King James Version. But at a certain point, not only did they claim that Mary was impregnated by Jesus, but that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. That eliminated us saying anything about her being one of the women who actually supported Jesus and the unemployed guy he hung up with for like three years, which was the fact. The fact is that Mary Magdalene met Jesus and Mary, yes, she did impact his life and caused her to start changing, but she was never a prostitute. She was a very According to the Christian theologian, a very rich woman who hung out with other rich women, and they backed Jesus and his disciples. That's how they were able to go three years, you know, without working. But when uh, Christianity got to Europe, the Catholic Church had a fight, had a fight, and the group that won changed, said Jesus was born to God impregnating Mary, and that Mary Magdalene was in fact a prostitute. Now, I don't know again what this crisis they started, but we get on some stuff where I digress because I used to be a Christian and you know a whole lot of that stuff that didn't help me, John. Help me to get out of this. <laughs> mm. You know, so much of this stuff you, you, you tell me, I gotta, after this, I gotta go do my research because you dropping, we, we going from parts of your career to a bunch of lighthearted, uh, funny, you know, comedic stories to some real serious topics that impact all our lives in, 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 in the way that we believe and see and think. Some of the stuff I've never even heard of. So I'm literally, as you're talking, writing this down, because after this, I got to go and do my own research. I had never heard that before. Really? <laughs> that was no, no, not obviously. We 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 know the Virgin Mary. We know uh, Mary Magdalene, but we know it. You know, I'm a Christian. I, I know it as right. I have been taught. And mind you, you I, know, when I talk so, like so, this, I'm not at all criticizing any religion. I'm simply talking about I was immersed in it, and by the time I was in my early twenties, a lot of stuff came to me that caused me to not want to be a Christian, okay? And I was impacted, for instance, by the fact that my grandfather and his minister friends were not only cheating on their wives, but, in, you know, getting down with a lot of ladies in the church. I'm a naive teenager, right? When I'm in my 20s, I'm also impacted, you can realize, hey, Christianity, you had a lot of white Christians during 350 years who used Christianity to, in fact, enslave brown skin people. That hit me, right? Uh, for that matter, and it had to be a racist thing because if, in fact, you were to worship Jesus as he is described in the Bible, as a woolly head brown skin person, you cannot ever enslave a woolly head brown skin person, which is what white America did for 250, 250 years. The only way they could do it, in this case, is to lie about the person they worship. And in the 
30s, 40s, and 50s are run up with white Christians who are the main people behind segregation. And when does it happen? I'm seeing white KKK members lynch, lynch, lynch black people, black men every other week and having white juries filled with white Christians exonerate them. Yeah, so by the time yeah. I'm 20, yeah. 21, 20, I'm being hit with that. And also, again, the whole thing that they lied about Jesus, for me, all of that impacted me by the time I'm. So I started my trip away from Christianity then. Not that I don't understand that you can be a Christian who knows all of that and who believes in the philosophy of Jesus and say, okay, I know all that, I'm still going to church. To me, I understand that. But for me, when I was in my early 20s, it made me not want to be a Christian. And to this day, I don't regret the church. Hmm. Mm. Wow. Wow. Very deep. Very, very deep. Um, okay. Let me, yes. let me bring yes. this thing back for a second. T talk to How did you get, you know, so many people who uh, are part of this generation, they might not know you from Cooley High, uh, Car Wash, Saturday Night Live, The Jeffersons, and I can keep naming them. They know you from right. Martin. They, they, that, that, that was, the, it, it feels like that was the right. reintroduction. Yeah. If you will. How, how did you get that part on Martin? <laughs> so Mark yes, made you yes. audition. Who, who was in your audition? Who was sitting at the other uh, side of the uh, table um, watching uh, you? Bentley Kyle Evans. Brilliant man, brilliant uh -huh. performer, producer, writer. And Martin and some other, I don't remember who else. I think Martin's manager, whose name I forget now. Uh, but yeah, um, audition, you know, and. Uh, so let me get this straight. Cause Martin grew up to you, just like I did. You telling me that Negro said, "Look, Garrett, I understand that you've been doing your thing long before I was born, but, but I need I you had to audition." No with that, cause there were other guys too. Remember the guy who played um, Bookman and um, um... sure, uh, what, what's yeah, his name, yeah. Johnny? Johnny, yeah, he, uh... he was also up for the court too. So hey, I understand that. So, so Bookman from Good Times was up for the for your. Well, party. it was not part of that, but at that time it was my part. He and I auditioned because I remember he told me later on that he auditioned for the part too. Wow. Okay. See, I have um, no problem with. Like I said, not, I go back. I talk about John Connery. Did I talk about John Connery? No, no, you you oh, you, 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 you told, told no, me about Sean the Godfather. Sean Connery had the audition for Godfather. Did you know that? No, no, no. Sean Connery no, Sean, had no, the no, Godfather. Me. Marlon Brando, rather, had the yeah. Marlon Brando. Marlon yes, Brando yep. Godfather. So, if I got a once, I knew that. Okay. I said, "Hey, he's an Oscar winner. Who's an Oscar it winner? Who definitely make money and then film me is in." in and they say to this motherfucker, audition, I say, well, get off your high horse, Gary, you know? Okay, well, while, while you, your career is reviving with Martin, because that's where so many people came to know and love you and, and, and that character you played, you get shot on the yeah. streets in Los Angeles. How the hell that happened? Because I gotta believe anybody who is, from our community was watching Martin and see you walking down the street. They know exactly who the hell well, you are. Well, this person, um, I'm walking down the street. I won't get lost here, Bond Street. Two people come in toward me, they pass me, but I don't realize they didn't turn around. The guy grabs me, right? Um, and there's a little girl with him. And, um, Look, I'm five, at that time, I'm five foot six, didn't weigh much. When I turned around, I saw a guy that was five, nine, five, ten, he must have weighed about 190 pounds. Um, but when he grabbed me, 
he misinterpreted what I would do. So what I did, I guess it really embarrassed him a little bit because um, across the street there had been people across the street who had been saying, hey, Stan, hey, Stan, hey, Stan, hey, Stan. But this guy um, was one of those. He was uh, he was going to rob me, I think. So I wore this leather um, jacket with uh, Af Africa, the map of Africa on the back. I think he wanted that. When I turned around, though, he had the gun pointing at me. And that's when I stopped and I said, hey, hold on, hold on. He shoots me in the arm, goes to my arm and to my uh, intestines. Um, it messed up my uh, intestines that I had to have a colostomy for like five, six, seven months. And uh, it led to me being in the hospital for 10 major operations um, for like three months. Damn. And I was in the coma for like two to three days. Yeah. Hold, hold on, you you were shot one, one time. It really it was one bullet went then through it went your to arm. My, from my arm it went through my. I tell you, problem with my ulnar. It went through my arm, hit my uh, intestine, and it ricocheted. The ricochet to my body. Thank God, it didn't ricochet into my heart. Can you hear that? I've heard that too. Uh -huh. It went to my lower lumbar fire, my lumbar fire. And because it had been ricocheted, it stopped. The hardness of the bone stopped it into the middle of my lumbar fire, which stayed there until it got infected. Then they had to take out the bullet and my lumbar fire. So they told me then I wouldn't be able to walk or run. Well, they lied about the walking because I was walking from 1994 to about three years ago. But running, I haven't, before that, in 1993, I had run the marathon. But I haven't done that since. Get out. It's, so again, you, you're Stan, Stan Winters, I think was the last name of the character you played, or Martin. You, this dude clearly knew who you was. He had to know. Do, do you think it was just you embarrassing him? That made him pull this trigger? Because it couldn't have been. I can't get into the guy's mind. All I know is when I turned around, the gun was pointing at me. I was going to decide. I turned around, ready. Look, although I knew I probably would lose a fight, but I turned around, I saw you bigger than mm -hmm. me. I was, yeah, I was going to side kick him and get, hey, let's get into it. When I turned around, he had a gun, which I didn't know. Had I had known he had a gun from the first, I wouldn't have moved at all. But the fact that he shot so quick means that I was told later on by the cops that the people on the street said the gun was had one arm like here holding me tight, the left arm, and the other arm had the gun to my rib. So had he shot me then, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. So he's ready to shoot. He's ready to shoot. Wow. Okay. It, it, something else that I heard, and I, and I guess I'm just going to ask you straight, straight up. I know the character... Uh, Stan was written off the show. Uh, I, I, I want to believe one of the last scenes, if not the last scene, uh, that you were in, in Martin, it was it was actually filmed in the hospital. Yeah. Were you essentially fired from that show while? Yeah. Now in the look, hospital? you and I talked before about this, okay? So I don't want to go into that. I don't care. You know, I've talked about it enough. Yeah. I show. Fair I show was fired. Enough. I have no idea what happened. Damn. Okay, your, your, your career bounces way back and you land on oh, Jamie Foxx. Oh, thank you so much, Jamie. Boy, he was, oh, such a breath of fresh air. The guy's a genius, he was funny, comedian. He uh, an organist and a piano player, composer, singer. Uh, right now, by the way, Jamie is in this movie called the burial. Have you seen yep, it? Yep, yep. Him and Tommy yeah, Lee he, Jones, I think. I think yeah, it's Tommy Lee it? Jones. No, I haven't no, seen you it. Gotta check it out. You got to check it out, man. It's a great movie. Great movie. Great. Yeah. Great film. Yeah? Great film. 
Okay, so so this is another one of your beloved characters. Give me Uncle Junior. I mean, everybody knows Uncle Junior. It seemed like that, that, I mean, just watching it, I'm looking at it like any other fan. It seemed like y'all had a really, really Oh, I love that show. And a I love real that show. I love that show. Uh, Jamie was such fun. Uh, quite often, he wouldn't go to the dressing room between set. He'd, he'd be talking and making funny people laugh. Sometimes I miss going back to my dressing room to dress for the next scene. Could I be sitting there listening to him? Uh, Garcelle Beauvais, a uh, great, beautiful lady to work with. And one of my main men right now is Braxton, Christopher Duncan, right? Elliot, of course, Elliot. Oh, you hell, still keep yeah. in touch Elliot with him? English, of course, love working with her. But Christopher Duncan and I uh, talk all, all the time on the phone. I think Christopher is one of the most brilliant actors in the country. Very much underappreciated, okay? I think Christopher can do anything from Shakespeare to OG without batting an eyelash. Okay. Got that kind of talent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Brilliant man. Nah, he, 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 he really is a brilliant man. And like you said, Jamie, he's, he's so brilliant. And I, and I love, I love, because whenever anybody talks about Jamie, you never hear nothing no. bad. It's always this guy's the life of the party. Whatever it is that we see on the screen, it seems like behind the scenes, he's every bit of it. When you found out that he got huh? sick, how did you hear the news and how did it even affect you? And and, and, and thank God it seems like he's doing Yeah, I, I just heard it on, I don't remember who told me, but it might have been on the internet, might have been on the phone, might have been somebody called me. But yeah, I heard I was very discouraged by it, you know. And by the way, people should know that Jamie is very supportive because I had a five-year contract, right? But I only worked on the show for four years. Why? Because the fifth year, if you remember, they changed the set to the office where G, G, uh, Jamie was a jingle writer. So that, that meant yep. neither Elliot, yep. nor I, nor Christopher were in it anymore. And we all got paid. What, what do you mean? You got paid for, for the that season of work I that got you didn't actually work every in? fucking week. You no. got to be kidding me. No, 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 okay, so nobody been talk bad you. about Jamie Foxx. Don't get around me. So, okay, so so I gotta ask. He's clearly the show is named after him. He's the executive producer of the show. Is is it him who makes that final decision that says, "Look, my people need to get paid"? How would I know, John? I don't know. I just know we got a check, and I know he could have challenged it. He could have said a whole lot of things. All of it. The producer could have said, you know, no, why, 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 nothing. So, you know. You know, shout to that guy, man. He, he, every every time I hear a story about him, he's yeah. a class act. Yes. Um, yeah. He really, really is. And, and it seems, it seems like this dude, uh, he truly cares about his fellow he did. He did. He did. He did. around him. Yeah. He did. Yeah, good for him. You know, before I let you up out of here, I want to talk about one more of your, your major role. My time, um, my time so in jail, I will not talk about it, okay? All right? Go ahead. <laughs> I okay. am loud clear. Come on, I know you talk about this. Two broke girls. You, you, you oh started on it earlier. Great show, man. Which, which they that show, yeah. Um, Beth, uh, Kat, uh, Jonathan Kite, uh, Michael, uh, Matthew Moy, and um, the great, I mean, great lady Jennifer Coolidge. Uh, it was a great chance to be in, man. Yes, and all of them were great, but Jennifer just over the top, man. Over the top. Matter of fact, she has a costume party in New Orleans, she has a place in New Orleans. 
And every year I go to that costume party. Man, I just came back. Yeah. Oh, for Halloween. Oh, yeah. For Halloween, yeah. You know, that's so dope that you mentioned her in particular because she's another one. It feels like she's been grinding for so many years and she's finally right. getting her flowers. She's finally getting that recognition on, on, on a very she was in pretty level. Way. But this is... Yeah. There you go. There you go. This woman finally, after it's all getting... these years, she's getting her flowers. And, and here's another thing, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to try to choose my words as best as I can. But, you know, Hollywood is not always no. kind. Uh, to, to nope. aging women. They're not always kind to women who are not, uh, you know, rail right. thin or, or you know, have had any types of uh, body enhancements. Right. Well, she has... And she is winning on sheer right. talent. Right. She is, I, I think she's brilliant. I think she can do anything. Any, she anything. really is. You, again, like I said about Christmas, you throw... Uh, OG stuff or Shakespeare at her, she will, she will upstage anybody on the stage. Okay, she will. Okay, because I was ready. If you remember seeing that show, it was obvious when she came on, the audience went crazy. Every time, she just had to yes. show up, and then she delivered. She delivered. She never didn't. Deliver. She always did it. You know, she was a bit of bit. She's an amazing actor. Yeah. She she really is. Now, now, does she just have a place in New Orleans, or is that where she's from? She's not from New Orleans, but yeah, she for like at least the last maybe twenty years, she bought uh, what used to be a plantation, but it's a three story mansion. On um, guess what street she lives on? Are you ready? What? She lives on Rich Street. What? <laughs> 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 we live on Race Street, R A C E, and the lower, uh, 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 lower uh, corner. Anyway, she lives on the Race Street, uh, and it's really because going to the house, whenever I put that, I say Race Street, what the hell, you know? Oh, yes, you know, she, she's great, man. She's great. And she lived there. She has a three story mansion, and when you go there for the costume party, everybody is, hey, they're serious costumers, okay? If you go there, you better, you better come there ready because they, they, the costume party people, they ain't jiving, man. You have all kinds of costumes, you know? And, really, and one of my best costumers is a guy who was in Martin, Jonathan Grimes. Remember the guy, the white guy who was in the... the um, he played the white guy in the studio. In the oh, yeah, yeah, He's yeah. one of my best friends yeah. to this day. And when he goes to the costume party, get ready, because he, he's no slouch. He did he did Tina Turner one, one year, okay? And except for the fact that he was white, I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that say a lot about his costume or say a lot about her. <laughs> I, I, I guess I'll just say, yeah, yeah. say a lot about but his Jennifer costume. Jennifer is uh, down, man. She's really down. Boy, she's great. I love her. Nah, she, she, she's, a, she's a talent, but she really is, and I'm so happy to see that she's being recognized and she's breaking so yes. many stereotypes, you know, as she's doing it. But good for her. Okay, now that this the SAG after your strike is over, what, what can we expect from you? Hey, if they want me, I'm ready to work. You know, um, my agent told me a couple of things, you know, which I didn't really have a name for that I'm looking for. But I, you know, I'm seriously compromised because I can't move like I used to be. So by the same, and I'm aware of the fact that cast, casting quite often eliminates women who aren't thin, you know, and frail, uh, and people who aren't healthy, right? Uh, if you have you take you get you have somebody in a wheelchair, you're gonna get a healthy actor to act like he's unhealthy. Why? Here I am, you know. There's about a walker, you're gonna get a healthy actor and have to act like they well, 
here I am. I got to walk. So um, that, you know, there's some problems you have to deal with, but I'm ready to go. Anybody want to hire me? Okay. Let's say those calls don't come. Can, can you can you sit back and look over your career and say, you know what? I have I do that to run. Yeah, I do that now. No regret. I do that now. Every, every year Good you see you. Uh, people going on to the other side, like Richard Brownkey, uh just left us, you know. People you know, um, Melvin Van Peebles, who I work with, God. Uh, you know, um, there's a great guy, a beautiful man, great director, Gilbert Moses, who died, um, yeah, about 20 years oh, ago. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, female names, names don't come up, but, um, you know, I, I taught myself fortunate to be here, still able to, you know, be there and talk to you. So right now, I'm just, thankful for my career and uh, thankful for the fact that I'm here able to talk to beautiful men like yourself, you know, because you got it going too, bro. Uh, you talk about me, you star, your damn self, brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying no, to get you to your level. Good. But, but I'm going I'm to tell you something and, 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 you know, I, and I say this with all sincereness. I know we've been laughing and joking throughout this conversation, but you have bought so much. You know, I remember the first time I had the opportunity to sit with you. It, I, I lit up. And it's very, it's very uh, few times that, that I sit with people and, and something from the inside, you know, it just lights up. And, and, and I say, I can't <laughs> wait to sit with this person, to pick their brain, to hear their well, story, and then to sit with well, them. I'm glad, I'm glad you go didn't go to the 35th Priest thing in Hollywood, okay? <laughs> Whatever. But my question is, does it ever, does it, does it surprise yes, you? Yes, it does. Because you just, you're just you. Does it surprise you that you have a, affected and touched so yes. many lives yeah. Yeah, because it, it does, I really. had in my background that you know, you know, cocaine and all a lot of serious mistakes. Okay, which um, I don't feel guilty about it, but I feel more like I made bad choices and I've got to make better choices now. Okay, um, and there's a certain bit of my life that I would not want anybody to emulate. Okay, uh, but if people deal with me in a positive way now, I feel good because I think I done what I've tried to do in the last 30, 30 years, and that is really correct a certain trajectory that my life was on. Okay? And to that extent, I feel we all owe coming generations a something they can emulate to bring them to a positive conclusion to whatever. So to the extent that that may be what I'm doing, I'm grateful. Okay? But in no way do I see myself as anything else but a work in progress. You know, and I, and I, and I, and I say this humbly, um, but that's why people love you so much. Because we're all works in progress. And, and, and you never try to be anything other than what you are. And I think that that's the relatability and, and, and that's the part of you that so many people thank can you, identify you, with. You. Yeah, so with that, I, 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 I have to say again, uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time as well. You know, I, I love our I appreciate being on your show, man. This is the second time, and I'm very thankful for you having me on the second time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your All time, right. Uncle G. You 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 are forever, <laughs> Uncle G. T tell tell K. Hey, tell Andre, Andre. part of the family. Andre. <laughs> okay, they're going to another room. But thank you. I'll tell me what you said, man, and thank you, man. Okay. All right, my brother. You be good. Continue to be blessed. And 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 one what? last thing, I'm gonna tell you. Man, there ain't no slipping with you. Your mind is functioning oh, like like you you are a uh, 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 twenty oh, year old or something. Like, good lord, your 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 mental <laughs> is all the way there. Thank you, man.
Thank Good you, for man. you. Now, if you can stop smoking them cigarettes, from I'm working on it. Working on it, man. Working on it. Okay. Same to you, love, man. Brother. Don't do anything I would. Oh yeah, Drake, come here, come here. Peep in and say goodbye to my man. Where Dre at? Dre, what up? Yeah, Dre, Dre, I'm an honorary I'm part of the family. He's he forever Uncle G. I'm never calling you Garrett, Mr. Garrett Morris ever again. You okay? All right, bro. Sean, take it easy, man. Good luck on continue to luck on your program, man. All right. Thank I'm you so much. I'm looking, I'm looking for right. the best I'm one. Bye -bye. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.